We're going live with the entertainer today. We're going to get you ready for Giants training camp. We're going to take your questions and we're going to talk all things New York Giants. That's coming up next on the Locked on Giants podcast. You are Locked on Giants, your daily New York Giants podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. What's going on, Giant fans? Patricia Trainer here with you. It is the Lock on Giants podcast. We are live on this Friday, July 8th. And uh, if you don't remember the guy and, and the screen next to me, it's the <laughs> one, the only entertainer. Stand up, my friend. Yeah, glad to be back. Uh, just taking a little bit of a break during the downtime and, and um, can't wait for training camp to get started. We're about uh, almost two weeks away. So yeah. once that gets going, there's going to be a lot to talk about. Excited about the season. Talk about some of the training camp battles. Um, I'm sure we'll talk about some of those things on this pod as well. But hope you're enjoying your summer and, and hope uh, everybody listens and enjoying their summer as well. Yeah, you know, the one thing about summer break is I have to, I have a confession to make. I look forward to it because we're going nonstop now. I mean, covering an NFL team has literally become a year-round thing. Yeah. So it just seems like, you know, by the time the break comes, it's like, ah, oh, finally, I can kick back and relax. And I've been doing some different things. I've been drawing. I've been reading. I've been just, you know, kind of, you know, hanging out and whatnot. And I'm looking at the calendar and I'm going – geez, where's the six weeks going so fast? Because we're, what, about four <laughs> weeks in? And we've got another couple weeks before the rookies report, and then the the, uh, the vets are going to report, and then it's just going to be the grind. And I'm like, I'm ready for it. Don't get me wrong. But it's like, I also like the six weeks downtime because even I need a break every once in a while. Yeah, it gets a little redundant. You know, you, you need to take a little bit of a break uh, when there's not much to talk about. But like you said, there's going to be a whole lot to talk about uh, real soon. And I'm, I'm looking forward to it. A new regime change, new head coach, new GM. And, um, you know, we'll see how this team hits the ground running. They do play a pretty soft schedule. So maybe we surprise some people. We'll see. Yeah, maybe. So, all right. Well, we're going to get everybody ready for training camp. We're not going to make roster predictions because I just don't think that's a wise way to it's go. It's premature. It's premature. Right. But what we can talk about is some of the storylines that are emerging, you know, some of the battles, some of the questions and whatnot. And I want to kick off by asking you, what do you think is the most number one top pressing question this team is facing heading into training camp? Yeah, I mean, you could go a lot of ways with that, uh, for sure. You could go the transition to the new offense. You could go Daniel Jones. You could go, uh, you know, portions of the offensive line. But for me, it's cornerback. Um, and it's been cornerback for a bit now. Um, really, after the draft, I thought that was one of our biggest pressing needs going in. Yeah, we drafted Cordell Flott, but he seems to be more, you know, of a project and a guy that you're probably not going to want to throw in there day one. Um, Aaron Robinson's probably going to be the starter opposite of Dory Jackson. Jackson was our number two corner last year. And knowing the type of defense we want to run, how aggressive we want to be, uh, we need strong cornerback play. So I think that's my biggest question, my biggest fear going into the year. Last year, it was the tackle position opposite Andrew Thomas. Um, this year, it's cornerback. And, you know, I even say to myself, even if Aaron Robinson does live up to the expectations, we're one of Dory Jackson injury away from having two guys who basically have never played in the NFL at those positions starting for the New York Giants in a defense that um, <laughs> heavily – heavily um you know needs a good cornerback play so we'll see but I, I think that's my biggest question mark going in yeah I I would kind of agree with that but I, I'm gonna go more so with the offense I mean you know I was I was just starting to write something for a Giants country or position previews and whatnot and I am just absolutely amazed that after three seasons we still don't know what this team has in Daniel Jones yeah and part of that, you know, was the Giants' fault because there's been no stability. There's There's been, you know, different coaches. There's been different systems and whatnot. But a big part of that is also on Daniel. And I, and I really, I want to believe that he's the guy. I want to give him the benefit of the doubt. I'm having trouble, though. I got to be honest with you because it's like people are coming at me and saying, well, what about this, this, and this? And I can't dispute the arguments. I mean, yep. normally I, I can find, you know, I can find logic in, in some of the counter arguments. But this one... You know, and, and here's the other thing that kind of bothers me, Chris, is that, you know, even if Jones does play well, how well does what does he have to play? Because here's the thing. Ideally, you want your quarterback, you want to start having the team ascend 
when your quarterback's in his rookie contract year, or in his rookie contract, rather. Daniel's not going to be in his rookie contract after this year. Yeah. So I feel like they've wasted the last several years with him by futzing around and not putting stability around him, not, not giving him, you know, what he needed. I mean, again, he's part of the problem. I don't want people to think that he's blameless, mm -hmm. but that to me is like a huge, huge concern for me. The cornerback situation, I agree with you, but I think they're going to be okay there. As long as the front seven are, are playing well, the quarterback situation to me, I would think is, 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 the bigger issue, but well, quarter, you know. quarterback's obviously the most important position on a football team. And, and I agree with you in that sense that uh, we still don't know what we have in Daniel Jones, the way I look at it though. Um, and I, I am far from convinced on Daniel Jones. Um, I thought the giants made the right decision, not drafting a quarterback this year for several factors. Mm -hmm. um, the main one being that it was a weak quarterback draft class and next year's a much, or at least thought to be a much stronger class. We'll see how the players perform in college leading up to the draft. But the way I look at it, as far as the quarterback position, at least when I'm thinking, not even just this year specifically. I think the Giants have set it up for the whoever is going to end up replacing Jones if he does not take a big leap um, to be successful. I mean, now you got two high end tackles, or they better be high end tackles for the amount of draft capital we spent there. And you bring in a, a more modern day offensive line with Brian Dable, who I think is going to help out Daniel Jones. And I think DJ will play better this year. The question is how much better. Um, but I do think he'll be an improved quarterback. I just don't know if he'll be improved enough because, like you said, uh, in the NFL today, it's very hard to win when your quarterback's making a lot of money. Yeah, it, it is. Now, a question I get a lot, and I I can't really give an answer because I don't think you can quantify this, is what does Daniel Jones have to show to convince the Giants that he's worthy of the next contract? And a lot of people throw at me stats. And I think stats are very it, – it's hard to, to quantify in that regard. My response to that question is, is – Show me that you can go from being a game manager to a game winner. Because let's face it, when was the, how many times in Daniel Jones's career has he come through where you've said, okay, gosh, I'm glad the game's on the line and he's behind center because he's going to he's gonna pull it out. Two times? Maybe yeah. Three, two, maybe three, two or three Two, times. three. And, and, and most of those were in his rookie se season, if I'm not mistaken. You have the Saints game last year. That that comes to mind. And, and then you got the right. Bucks game, his first start. Right. His, his um, rookie, right. And maybe, maybe I mean, maybe you could argue the Eagles game. And, you know, they kind of choked it away from him in, in that game. But it's been, let's put it this way, it's been less than five. Yes. Definitely less than five. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, you see the same mistakes. You see, you know, the pocket awareness hasn't improved. You, you, you see the mistakes, like I said, you know, forcing stuff in. And, you know, granted, I think last year, Joe Judge and that staff kind of messed with his mind a little bit. And that they wanted him to be more conservative, yeah. which just doesn't fit what he does. So, you know, I, I like what Brian Dable. I agree with you on that, by the way. I, I, I just want to I agree with you that it doesn't fit what he does. To me, being that conservative doesn't fit what any quarterback does in today's NFL. Mm -hmm. Like you can't win games on a consistent basis playing as conservative as the way that Joe Judge did. Uh, with the New York Giants over the last two years offensively. It's it's an offensive league. It it, it is it has become an offensive league. Now, if you have an all-world defense, yeah, you could get by and, and you could find ways to win games. But the Giants didn't have anywhere close to that. Um, and it's why I think a lot of Giants fans were kind of fed up with Jason Garrett and Joe Judge's philosophy being as conservative as they were. I, I don't even think it's just specifically Daniel Jones. I think yeah. it's any quarterback in today's league. You can't consistently win football games with that with that type of philosophy. Yeah, it, it was surprising considering all the bravado we heard from Joe Judge and, you know, how we're going to punch you in the mouth for 60 minutes and we're going to do this, we're going to do that. And I was like, dude, what happened? Yeah. It was like, I thought they were more daring the first season. Now, maybe part of that was because, you know, they felt the offensive line was was pure garbage. Understandable. <laughs> I mean, maybe that's why they pulled it back. I don't know. But, you know, there has to be – there had to have been more of a balance. But, you know, that's in the past. Brian Dable, you know, from what I saw in the spring, I think I think they're going to be a little bit more aggressive. Um, they're going to try some things that they haven't done. And what I like about the offense, from what I saw in the spring, is, is they're going to take some of the decision-making away from Daniel Jones. And by that, I mean it's going to be – quick drop back and get the ball out of your hands and don't have to sit there and, and process things because that's been a weakness of Daniel Jones. Jones is uh, for gosh, no, you know, for a long time now. So yeah. that's going to help. They will take some deep shots. 
down the field. But I think those are going to be strategically placed. And here's the other thing. This is going to kind of lead into the next point I wanted to make. I think what they want to do early on, at least, until they get you know everything up and running with the passing game, get that running game going. Because if you can get some sort of offense going, and, and you know the running game is going to be their best bet, I think, just until the the passing game kind of catches up. Because you know the receivers, they got to get in sync with with the quarterback. And by the way, this week they're working down in I think in Duke. Uh, I saw that. Yeah, work, Daniel you know, Jones worked. Yeah, out. but yeah. but you know they 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 still have to get get in there. You know, the, Galladay, Shepard, Tony, uh, those guys missed all the spring. So you want to get that receiving, that timing in in place there. And uh, I, I just think it's going to take a little time. And we saw last year how when Galladay was sidelined, you know, any chemistry he built up went away. And it was like when he came back, it was like he and Jones were not on the same page. It took a long time for them to get on the same page. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head. And I, I just want to say thank you. Uh, I see a couple of people saying they missed my vids. Welcome back. Yeah, man, I appreciate all the all the love and support you guys always show. Um, thank you guys for being here. I just, uh, I, 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 th- it comes a point in the offseason where I just feel like I need to take a break because I don't want to be too redundant. I don't want to put out nonsense for you guys because there's not a whole lot to talk about. But the vids are coming back. We're going to have a lot to talk about. Uh, in a couple of weeks, but um, thank you. Thank you for all the support you guys always show on everybody's channel on YouTube and in, in, in the uh, Giants community. I appreciate it. Um, as far as uh, what you said, though, I think you hit the nail on the head with the offense, and it's what I want to see because when you look at the playmakers on this New York Giants football team, they're guys that could they could make things happen in open space. Kadarius Tony, Saquon Barkley, Wendell Robinson. We've got guys that could, you know, rack up a lot of yak yards, and I think that has to be the offensive philosophy going into this year. Get the ball out quick. Don't make Jones think too much. Qu- create quick sep- uh, separation with pre-step motion, things like that. And that's what I expect to see in this offense. No more five, 10-yard curl routes where we're super predictable. I want to see pre-step motion. I want to see crossing patterns where, you, where you're able to get quick separation and make Jones's job easier. You know, get these guys open as quick as possible. Get the ball out quick. And we have guys that can make big plays when they have the ball in their hands. So I think that will be the offensive approach, and I think it should be. Yeah, and that and that's exactly what we saw, you know, in in the spring, you know, the little hints and whatnot we saw. Richard uh, Thomas asks if Daniels ever had a thousand yard running back first year. Saquon, I think, just barely went over a thousand yards. I think it was like what a thousand, one thousand three yards, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, uh, yes, I think he just cracked at the yeah. Year. Yes, I think. Yeah, right despite that. missing, I think he missed what four games or three games or something like that. Yeah, I think but he yes, he has cracked. had a thousand yard running back. But you know, again. Speaking of Saquon here, you know, I like what they did with him in the spring. And it's funny because coaching st- prior coaching staffs have done the same thing with splitting him out wide and ha- getting him on wheel routes and doing all this stuff, only to abandon that when he would get on get on the field in, in the games, which I never understood. People would be like, you lie. You said that they did this, this, and this, and they, they're not doing it. And I'm like, no, I swear they did it. You know, ask any of the beat writers that were there. But it looks like they're going to really return to what Saquon did best as a rookie, which was getting him out into space, not just as a runner, but also as a receiver. That element of his game kind of went away, if you think about it, because he he got a lot of check downs, you know. They kept sending him up the t- uh, up the to the teeth of the defense, the run defense, which I never understood. Considering, oh, especially say, when you can't block. Yeah, it's when you can't block, and and you have a guy who's not going to really lower his shoulder and and bowl people over. I mean, I I just never understood, and that's why I always used to say that the prior coaching staffs went and tried to fit a square peg into a round hole, and you can't do that. You just can't. Yeah, at least that's the feeling I get. The proof's in the pudding. We'll see uh, throughout the throughout uh, Brian Dable's tenure as the New York Giants head coach. But the feeling I get is he's going to put these players, at least on offense, um, in the best position to succeed. That's that's what you hear from prior players that have played for him. Um, and I agree with you. I, I think Saquon Barkley's strength is getting him out in space, um, whether it be screen passes, whether it be you know you have to use him more in the pass game. He had 91 catches in his rookie year. I know a lot of the, a lot of those were checkdowns from Eli. But I have a bold prediction, and um, I've said it a couple of times on Twitter. If, and it's a huge if, Saquon Barkley plays 17 games, I think he will lead the New York Giants in receptions this year. I think he's going to have – Oh, I agree. I think he's going to be used a lot in the passing game. Um, And I've got him pegged for close to 90 catches this year. I think they're going to use him a lot. Yeah. 
Yeah, I I absolutely agree. And, you know, and it's here's the other thing, you know, the pre-snap motion. So he could easily line up in the slot and then now he's in motion. And now maybe he takes a handoff instead. I mean, there's that much creativity that they showed in the springtime. I mean, you're going to see things. Those of you who might be going to training camp this year, you're probably going to see things that you, you've you never seen before from a Giants offense. And you're going to sit there and you're going to go, where's this been all my life? It's, it's been... going to be like we stepped in the DeLorean. I, it's, it's like, you know, <laughs> look, I like old school stuff. I, I'll be the first to know I'm an too. old school fan. But I also like to see an evolution of, the, of an offense and a defense and just watching some of these alignments and watching some of these plays and, and, and formations. I'm like, I'm sitting there going, Oh my God, I'm smiling. You know, I'm like, yeah. I'm like, this is going to be, if this all comes together the way they think it's going to come together, it's going to be a beautiful offense and an exciting offense to watch. I'm excited. I'm excited. And I, I, I think the let's put it this way. I don't know where we're going to rank, um, but I th I think you're going to leave this season having some hope for the future of this offense. I, I do think it's going to be a much more fun team to watch on the offensive side of the football defense. I could potentially see them taking a step back and I hope not. Um, I'm excited mm -hmm. about the rookie cave on Thibodeau, but I really do worry about that secondary, but I hope those guys prove me wrong and I hope they're fantastic. And like you said, if the front seven is much improved, which it should be uh, with the addition of Thibodeau, It'll assist that secondary. So we'll see. But um, I'm just excited to see how it all pans out. Yeah, I am as well. And by the way, folks, I see some of some questions are, are popping in. I see Tim Frith is is, is proposing his usual uh, creative Tim, trade. Tim, Tim definitely comes up with creative trade ideas. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. I mean, <laughs> he's in the chat group there. You can see some of his trades there. Tim, Tim, my gosh, you should put some of those trades together and put them in a book. Every year, Tim's <laughs> Tim's Giants trades. I mean, I, I'd buy it. Wouldn't you? Wouldn't I, you I, it makes me laugh every time I see him. He, I'm he, telling he, he, you, man. he definitely has an outside the box uh, brain. No doubt about it. I know, I know. So anyway, yeah, folks, put put your questions in the box. We'll get to them throughout the show. All right, Tana, got to ask you this: offensive line, different or better? Better. I think it'll be better. I, I think it's going to struggle the first half of the season. Uh, because you have four new offensive linemen, so I don't think it's just going to click right away. But I think it'll be better. I, I think we have an improved uh, guard, obviously, with Golinski, and you have to figure Evan Neal is going to be much better than Nate Solder. I don't care if he's a rookie or not. Um, and hopefully Andrew Thomas could remain healthy this year. He wasn't able to do that last year. But, um, yeah, I think it'll be better. I don't know if it's going to be uh, where I want it. I don't think it's going to be where I want it to be by year's end, but I think it'll start to be trending that way. But uh, yeah, I think over the second half of the year, we're going to see a pretty good offensive line. Yeah. And you know, what's interesting about the offensive line, if you think about it is okay, the interiors I think is better, yeah. but you also have two, at least, all right, you've got center John Feliciano is only there on a one year deal. So I don't know that he's the long-term answer there. So at some point you're going to need to replace him. Um, you don't know for sure. If Shane Lemieux is going to be your, your left guard, your starter at left what, guard. Although your, I think what's it's your opinion me. on that? I've seen people go back and you know, forth. I've gone back and forth on that as well. I think he's the incumbent. But um, gosh, you know, they've got so many guys there on one-year deals. And yeah. I'm just sitting here and I'm like, they're going to have to shake this unit up again next year, if you think about it. Because I don't think they'll re-sign all these guys. They've got Garcia. They've got Jameel Douglas. Um, they brought in that kid, Matt Gona, who's a uh, backup tackle right now. I, I'm, I mean... They don't have a, a true center. I mean, you, you can make the argument that Gates, but Gates is a converted, you know, tackle slash guard. I don't Gates play and it. Gates, I don't know if Gates is going to play this year. I hope he does, by yeah, the way, but I, I don't know that he will. So I don't know. It's it's like, you know, the center to, position to me is, is very important. And I'm glad they're bringing in Feliciano, who has experience playing for Dable's offense and whatnot. But what do you do for the future? I mean, maybe I shouldn't worry no, about yeah, it. No, yeah, I'm right with now, you. But... I, I think Feliciano made sense for this year for that exact reason. He's had experience with the offensive line coach. He's had experience with Dable. Um, so it's like a one-year transition period. Makes sense, especially knowing that Nick Gates probably is not going to start the season. But we don't have a long-term answer at that position. Um, yeah. And, and it, hopefully Azuda develops. We don't know. I don't think he's going to start the year, but hopefully he yeah. develops. Um, but right now we only have two – for sure, 
guys that we, you know, know we could pencil in on that offensive line, and that's the two tackles for the foreseeable future. Well, um, and Glowinski too, don't forget. Yeah, for a year or two. Maybe yeah, three. for a couple of years. Yeah, a couple of years. But, but I, I, I still think the Giants are going to have to continue to attack the offensive line in next year's draft. Not in the first round. Well, you know, the thing, though, Chris, is, is remember, before Shane came in, the cupboard was bare. They didn't even have anybody in development. Yep. So – I think what Shane did, and I kind of like this approach, is, you know, okay, let's bring in some veterans on a one-year deal, see how they do. Meanwhile, let's bring in some of these young kids, start developing them yep. and see what we've got, and then next year we'll assess what we need to do as far as this offensive line goes. So they finally restocked that cupboard. Whether or not they've got quality in the cupboard, that's another story. We'll find that out once we get to training camp. So that's that's the approach they kind of took. All right. Let's take a question here from Wolves Zay. Do you think training camp will be a camp co-tight? I got to be honest with you, Wolfie. I am not sure what you're referencing. You mean a, a light He's camp? referencing Rich Kotite, but I don't know. He, and he says it later, who is the Jets guy? I know but who I, Rich Kotite was, but... But I, I I don't know what you're referring to when you say a camp co-tight. What, yeah, that I don't know the reference. Wolf. Yeah, I, I'm not sure what you, what you mean, Wolfie. You clarify that for us, and we'll, we'll we'll circle back to you on that. Um, let's see if we have any other questions just yet. All right, no, nothing else popping up yet. But you know, we'll get. I'm sure we'll get them. As it's we definitely get gonna be a lot different than judges camps. I'll say that. Yes, you know, and and that's a, that's a good point. When, just some of the differences, because um, I get that question a lot too. Judge ran a very physical and hard camp. Yeah. He um, believed in conditioning, which, you know, every coach does. But Dable's approach is going to be somewhere in the middle, meaning that his feeling was, look, we're running around. We're doing all these football activities. We're getting conditioning as we go along. Now, will they do extra conditioning? That will be on a case-by-case -case basis. It's not going to be every day after practice automatically you're going to do um, you know, you're going to do str uh, sprints and whatnot. The other thing they brought back, which I am thankful for, because I never understood why it went away, is they do post-practice stretching. They stopped doing that after Coughlin. You remember the old bands thing? Yeah, they yeah. They stopped doing that. And I wondered about that, why that went away, because that helps with with recovery, you know, post-stretching, you know, get some blood into the area. And supposedly that reduces soreness. I don't know. I'm not a, a sports scientist, so I, I don't know the – the you know the explanation behind that but uh i've had people who are in, in that field say yes you definitely want to stretch after you know bringing your heart rate back down and and before you go and you do anything else hmm. all right so, so hopefully that helps with the injuries i i've been trying to put my finger on what what's the primary problem we've had more injuries by a mile than any other team uh <laughs> over the last decade and and hopefully that helps a bit we'll see well you know it's interesting because the Bills, if I'm not mistaken, weren't they one of the least injured teams? So they, I think they were, yeah. That, so I, I, I got to believe that Shane and Dable and, and any of the coaches that came down from Buffalo, maybe they have an idea of what to do, what not to do. I Hopefully. mean, I, I hope so, because these injuries <laughs> have absolutely destroyed this team, you know. Besides their own incompetence, would still would build the roster up. But all right, let's see. We got a question here from. Uh, let me pull the question up from Duran Osman. What are your expectations for Blake Martinez coming back from his ACL? It's a good question. Yeah, you know what? With ACL injuries, usually the earlier you you have them, the better your chances are of making a full recovery. So Blake was injured early on. Um, I. Didn't get to see him moving around all that much because he was on a backfield. So my eyesight can only go so far. Um, but I think with what they might be asking Blake to do this year, I think he's going to be okay. I'm not so sure Blake's going to be an every down linebacker as he was really? with the old system. I, 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 I don't get that impression. Okay, And it's not because of the injury. I think it's just because of how they're going to play this defense. Um, you're going to see... A lot of guys, like there will be certain guys who will be every down players, but I'm not so sure that's going to be the case in the front seven. You're going to see some guys are going to obviously play more than others, but I think the days of the the every down player, like, you know, okay, who's going to wear the helmet? You might see Xavier McKinney, who I think is going to be an every down player wearing the helmet and and, and doing all that stuff. So, what I mean, just, is an every down, let me, let me go my every down players, Leonard Williams. Leonard, um, well, Leonard Williams was close. Um, in the past, it would be like Blake Martinez. And then when he got injured, Tate Crowder. 
Uh, James are. Bradbury would be every down. Logan Ryan would be an every down player. McKinney, I think, like you said. Yeah, I uh, think Adore Adore Jackson. Jackson a couple of times was an every down. You know, so that's I, I'd be surprised, you know, just based on, again, some of the, the, the things I saw in the spring. Now, again, remember, they could have been experimenting. They could have said, okay, you know, we're going to try this. We're going to try that. But I wonder if, if Blake is going to be an every down player this year. Because um, remember, they 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 amended his contract. This is technically his last year. He's got a voidable year, I believe, after this year. So that tells me that ultimately they're going to maybe want to move on from him. Maybe they're going to replace him or or, or supplement his some of his snaps, give some of his snaps to some of these younger guys. Or maybe, they, you know, Martindale's going to do some creative stuff. I don't know. It's it's just there's a lot of possibilities there. But I, I just based on what I saw in the spring, I'm like, yeah, you know, and Blake didn't didn't work as much during the spring. I want to make that clear. But yeah, just based on what, what what you saw with guys coming in and out of the defense, you're like, OK. Maybe it's going to be, you know, you're going to have a mixture. You're going to have different looks. So, yeah, I mean, I again, I don't know what my expectations are until such time I see him out on the field and how they're going to use him and so on and so forth coming off the injury. But um, my expectations for Blake Martinez, I think this will be his last year on the team. I, I don't think he's going to be – or maybe, yeah, I, I don't see him being here much longer. Um, he's, a, he's a pending free agent unless he's willing to take a really cheap contract um, after this year. But if he could get any kind of – decent money on the free agency market. I don't think he's back with the Giants. I'll say that. Um, he did take a discount to come back coming off from the injury. I applaud him for that. Um, and I'm excited to see him back in New York Giants uniform. I, I don't know what his exact role is going to be. I think he's going to get the most snaps in terms of the middle linebackers. I mean, you have two oh, yeah. late round picks, uh, you know, in terms of his competition. So if he, if of they feel he can play, um, you know, uh, you know, the proper amount of snaps, but I don't think he's going to be here much longer. Uh, as a yeah. Child. Well, when I, when I say that, Chris, I mean I, I mean that I could see them putting more edge rushers out there. You know, pass yeah, rushers. Yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe you more. Know, that, that's what I'm. You know, safety. I yeah. do think Blake's going to lead the, the inside linebackers and in snaps. I just don't think he's going to be an every down player mm -hmm. as he was in the past. All right, we got an explanation from Wolf Say about that Camp Cotite um, Country Club scenario. Um, Wolfie, I don't think so. I don't think this is going to be a Country Club. I've covered that team. I've covered the Giants for, I, I want to say this is what, my 32nd, 33rd year. I'd have to go back and do the math, but it's over 30 years now. I've seen some country club training camps. I've seen some intense training camps. I've seen them fall in the middle. I think what Dable is going to do is he's going to work them, but he's not going to overwork them because here's the other thing. You overwork these guys, you're going to wear them out before the season starts. And they're going to have their tongues hanging out on the, on the on the ground. So you've got to strike a balance. And it's very difficult for a coach to do that. There are some coaches who say, you know what, we're going to just go at it 100 miles an hour and, you know, consequences be damned. I don't think they can do that, you know, because, look, I know <laughs> I'm in no way, shape or form, you know, an elite athlete. I'm not in bad shape yet. I mean, I'm still kind of young and I can handle, you know, the I don't think any of us stuff. watching. But that being said, that being said, you know, being out in the hot, humid weather and just standing there takes a lot out of me. I can just imagine what it takes a lot out of, you know, with, with these players who are running around and everything like that. I mean, we're human. So rest and recovery is going to be a big thing, obviously. But, um, you know, based on how I the, the practice schedule looks, I think they're going to be fine. I, I I don't think it's going to be a, a country club. I think it's going to be somewhere in the middle. They've got things they need to accomplish. They can't afford to be sitting there, you know, playing around and, you know, taking it easy. Yeah. I mean, I, I hopefully I, I, I just want them to win football games. I want them to remain healthy. Um, I know nothing about Dable in terms of being a head coach. So I don't know what kind of training camp he's going to run, but I think it's not going to be quite as strenuous as, as Joe judges was. Um, but that's probably a good thing. It yeah. seems like a lot of the players, when you heard after the fact, they weren't the biggest fans of Joe Judge and the way that he yeah. operated. Yeah. I mean, Joe was in a way trying to be Bill Belichick. And um, you, know, you got to win. You got to win. You got you got to win. And, you, you, you know, you've got to be your own person, too. You know, Brian Dable obviously worked for Belichick. I think he worked for Saban as well. But Dable is his own guy. You, yeah. can, you can kind of see that. He's not trying to be Sean McDermott. He's not trying to be Belichick. He's not trying to be Saban. He's his own guy. You know, he's he's the type of guy 
I'll tell you, he, 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 you could sit down and, 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 and have a beer with the guy. He's just, you know, I mean, you could with Joe as well, but, but Joe, you just kind of, he, Joe was so driven and so like, he had that. Joe, well, Joe liked beer. We saw that after the fact. He got, oh, like, yeah. he got like a hundred <laughs> beers uh, delivered to his house after he got. Well, fired. that was for a party he had. But, yeah. <laughs> uh, but, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, Brian's Brian Dable to me, very laid back, very, you know, when I say laid back, I, I don't mean not focused. I don't want people to get the wrong idea. He's but comfortable in his own skin. He's exactly. Exactly. That, that, that's the impression I got from his opening yep. press conference. I say it all the time. When I watched it, I felt like it's like when I come on YouTube, it's like I don't come out like super prepared. Like I just come out and talk about, give my opinion and feed exactly. off what people have to say. And He's I, not I scripted. felt that with Dable in his opening press conference. He came out, didn't look like he had like index cards before he came out there. He's like, I'm confident in my knowledge and I'm just going to sh shoot the shoot the crap for lack yeah. of a better word. I'm just going to talk to them as if. I'm at a bar having a beer with him. And that, and that's yeah. that's the impression I've gotten with Dable so far. Super nice guy. I mean, just just you know, real quick, the uh before the fourth of July uh holiday, I get a phone call and I'm like, I'm looking down and I'm like, I don't recognize the number. Now normally when I get a call, I'm like, huh, hey, you know, if I don't recognize the number, I let it go to voicemail. For some reason I pick this call up. Yeah. And uh so I I pick up the call. And, and there's a guy on the other line. He goes, hi, is this Patty? And I'm like, yeah, who's this? He goes, it's Dave's. And I said, <laughs> and I'm going, who? He goes, it's Dave's. And I'm saying to myself, who the hell is this? Who, who is this guy? So I'm like, Dave's? He goes, Brian Dable. I was That's like, awesome. I was like, wow. I said, I said, so finally connected. I, I put, uh, the, give know, him my <laughs> number. Maybe he'll give me a call. Me a call. <laughs> well, anyway, long story short, he, he called, I guess, you know, some of the writers or all the writers to wish us all a happy, you know, 4th of July. Awesome. He, he, you know, to say, you know, I'm looking forward to working with you, you know, the summer, you know, I hope you have a good rest of the summer. You know, if I can help you in any way, you know, within, you know, obviously within reason, obviously, uh, let me know. Just a real nice, you know, a, a short call, but I thought it was it was pretty cool, you know. And and he's also on Twitter, by the way. I found out because he's following me now on Twitter, so I'm I'm kind of like honored that the coaches follow me on Twitter. But um, but yeah, no, I just a, just a really cool, you know. Um, this is who Brian Dable is. He's a people person. Yeah, and. When you're a people person as opposed to a general or an authoritarian, you're generally going to get better results. And Judge tried to be a people person. I don't want to slam the guy because I did like Joe. Uh, I, like, I, still I like Joe. I, but I, I think I Joe at times. The way they did. I think Joe at times really. I I wonder if sometimes he slipped into to a mode that you know it's like he, he tried Joe to be was some, in a tough spot. Let's let's be perfect. He was. He was clear and fair. He was put in a tough spot, and maybe had he been put in a better spot, things would have worked out differently. Yeah, yeah. Um, I hope it works. I hope he gets another chance at, at being a head coach. I think I still think he could be a good head coach someday. Um, it just has to, you know, learn. And sometimes when you're in the same system all the time, you know, it's like you I think got he was a little too stubborn too. And I, right, and I hope yeah, he, he was stubborn. Oh, he was big time stubborn. You know, no I hope question. he learns from that and he grows. But as a, a great coach teacher, and, and he succeeds. Like I felt like it, like that kneel down play. You know, mm -hmm. like he had to know how that was going to be received by Giants fans. But he was like, screw it. I'm going to do things my way. I'm conservative. Yep. I don't believe in throwing this pass here with my third string quarterback. Exactly. We're going to take the kneel. Um, I think he was too stubborn in, in a sense. And that's just one example. I, there's several others you could point to. And hopefully, like I said, he grows from that and he learns and he becomes a better. Yeah. He's going to be, you know what? He's an excellent football teacher. I mean, we yeah. had a, a, during the bye week uh, last year, he invited uh, members of the media we were in small groups and we, we were invited to submit things we wanted to learn about, about the game. So I think we, we each got to submit like two or three topics and he took them and, and he tailored like classroom sessions to each topic. And it was, and he showed film and he was explaining stuff and he was at the, and a great teacher. I mean, yeah. I, I was, I, I walked out of there. Well, he got a master's or a, a doctor. Uh, absolutely. Teaching, right? Well, he's, I think he's, he's one dissertation away from a PhD in teaching. So it was just, you know, I enjoyed that. I wish more coaches would do that because it helps us understand so that we can convey that to the fans and stuff. So, you know, I just, you know, I, I think Joe's going to, you know, I think he, maybe he wasn't ready. 
uh, that he, he, he kind of did himself in with that long rant and everything like that. And, you know, I kept saying, dude, nobody wants to hear about the improvements behind the scene. We went through this with Shermer, for God's sake. So nobody wants to hear about that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so anyway. I, think, I think in the end, and we'll see, I think Judge is going to end up taking over for Belichick. Yeah, I, I, I could see that happening. I could see that happening. For That's sure. what I think happens. All right. Let's uh, get this question here from Dan B. What do we do if we have a way better season than expected, but Jones is not the reason? That's a great question, Dan. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, all right, I'll start. Okay, I, go for it. Here's what I'll say. If we have a way better season than expected, because right now expectations for the Giants, if you look at Vegas, and they generally know better than we do, is about seven wins. Um, and I think a lot of it has to do with the, the, the week schedule that the Giants play. And that's mm -hmm. kind of where I have the Giants, six to eight wins in that ballpark. Vegas seems to be begging you to bet the under, which makes me think they know something the general population doesn't, or at least that's what I'm hoping. Um, but if the Giants exceed expectations, which to me is at least nine, if not 10 wins, if they do that, Daniel Jones has to play at least pretty good. I, I don't think Jones could play horrible and we're going to win nine or 10 games. We don't, we don't have a well-rounded enough team in order to do that. Um, and, and my quick answer to you is if the Giants win 10 games, Jones is coming back. I don't know if he's going to get like a five-year extension, but they might do something, as I've said several other times, like the Raiders did with Carr. They gave Carr a three-year contract with the ability to get out after one. It's only a $5 million dead cap it after this year. But if the Giants win 10 games, they're making the playoffs. They're putting themselves in a situation where they're not going to be able to get a quarterback. People could say, oh, you could trade up. Every team in the league could trade up. And there's going to be – and there's teams that could potentially offer more than we can. And every team's looking for a quarterback. Nobody drafted one this year. Um, in a rich quarterback draft class. So if the Giants win 10 games, Jones is coming back. I yeah. don't think it's going to be a five-year extension, but I think he gets another year under center with, with this football team. Yeah, I'm with I'm with you on that. And, you, and you know, you mentioned the, the car contract. You know, I, I think they're going to also incorporate some of the tactics they did with, with uh, Josh Allen's contract in terms of the guaranteed money, right? That's structured so that, you know, uh, Josh Allen has to hit certain benchmarks in order to get more and more guaranteed money. It's really creative the way the Bills did that contract. I don't think it's going to be, I don't think it can be a five-year contract for Daniel Jones because again, think about it. You know, if he, if the Giants do well and, and Daniel plays well, okay, that's one year that he's, he's succeeded. You want to ideally see a couple of years before you make that kind of investment to go out and make a huge investment in a quarterback after, based on one season. That would make me a little nervous. If I'm, yeah, no, I agree. Know, I don't, honest. I don't, outside of him having like a Josh Allen year, which I do not expect. Um, I don't want to see the Giants giving this, and I don't think they will. I mean, they didn't pick up the fifth year option. Um, so I don't think they will. I see Ron Juan asking if his question is getting skipped. I'm going to scroll up, I'm going to find your question. So, Ron Juan yeah, Ron, it, says, Do you guys honestly believe Daniel Jones will have the type of year good enough to retain his job, especially being under a new system? Uh, Ron one, I, I, if you ask me, you said, Chris, is he going to retain his job or is he not? I'm going to say, no, I have the Giants penciled in for about seven wins in prior years. History would tell us Daniel Jones probably will not remain healthy throughout the course of a 17 game season. So right off the bat, if he doesn't do that, how can you, how can you commit yourself further to a guy who's never remained healthy throughout, throughout an entire NFL season, throughout his career has not had a lot of wins to his name. So do I think it's possible? Yeah, I think it's possible. I think that there's been improvements around Daniel Jones, which hopefully should improve to better quarterback play and, and result in more wins for this Giants football team. Do I expect it? No. I think in the end, in 2023, the Giants are going to be looking for a quarterback, maybe in the draft, may potentially be in free agency if they don't feel they're in a position to draft a quarterback. But um, do I think it's possible? Yeah, I think it is. I'd probably put it at about 25% that Jones will have a good enough year to at least give himself a little bit more rope uh, in his fifth season. But I'm definitely leaning more towards the side of, no, I think he'll be replaced in 2023. Yeah, I'm with you on that. And by the way, Ron Juan, and also the rest of you, I'm not skipping over questions. It's just we're getting a lot of, you know, we're talking and also a lot of you are posting. So some, so the, the uh, comments are kind of flying up. So I'm trying to scroll back up to find stuff. And if I, if I miss it, just post it again. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll eventually see it. And if I don't see it, Post it in the community section and uh, I'll do a mailbag. You know, I, I don't want anybody to think I'm skipping questions because I'm, I'm definitely not. 
uh, doing that. You guys are too important to me to skip your questions. So well, we love all you guys. We love, we all, love you. all of you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Well, 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 let's be fair. Not all of them. Once in a while you get a jerk, but most uh, of you guys, we love most of you guys. <laughs> Uh, well, okay. <laughs> I, I can go for that. All right, folks, got to take a quick break. I got to run a couple of commercials. One now, we'll run another uh, a little bit. So let me do the commercials and we'll be right back. Post those questions and we'll, we'll, we'll try and get to as many as we can on this show. So we'll be right back. Hey, Giant fans, if you're living paycheck to paycheck or struggling to make ends meet, it can be really stressful when the unexpected expenses come up. Well, now Dave can help you get out of a pinch when you really need it. Dave is the banking app that can help you get up to $500 instantly with extra cash. That's more money for you to fill your tank, buy a wedding gift, or catch up on bills. There's no interest and no credit check needed. Millions of people have already downloaded the Dave app to get the financial relief that they need with extra cash. So if you're in a pinch and need a little extra financial help, visit the App Store and download the Dave app. That's D-A-V-E. Sign up for an extra cash account and get up to $500 instantly. Future you will thank you. Terms and conditions apply. Instant transfer fees apply. Visit dave.com slash legal for complete information. And banking is provided by Evolve, member FDIC. I got to ask you a question about that app. Go ahead. Is it called D-A-B-E? Is it the Dave app or did I mishear that? Dave. Like oh, Dave. 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 Yes. D-A-V-E? V. Yeah. Like Victor. Oh, I was going to. Dave is great because a Dable. Dave <laughs> not so much because of Gettleman. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> listen, I, I, I just read what's on the schedule. So. <laughs> and, and by the way, I'm thankful to our sponsors. Our sponsors. Oh, are I'm just messing with you. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. I mean, I had somebody actually complain to me uh, on, on my YouTube. He's like, I love your show, but you run too many ads. I'm like, well, how do you expect? I, I said, you, you do realize that, you know, somebody's got to pay the bills, right? You exactly. Know? So, uh, you know. If you don't want like the ads, then you know do what I do look, when I'm watching TV. If I, if I don't want to watch a commercial, I turn and I look at Twitter or I look. Your audio is cutting out for me. I don't know if it's my end or your end, but the audio is cutting out. Let that let let us know in the chat, guys. Who? Well, you might not be able to hear me, but let us know in the chat who you can hear. I can't hear Patty right now. Um, and I'll wait till they say that. Uh, you like me entertain a crazy lunatic. Here we go. Put on Mike, man. Oh, I think I hear you now. Maybe. Briefly. So, it's Patty. Okay. It's Pat. Patty's muted. Okay. It's Patty's muted. Okay. She'll come back on. This has happened a couple of times when we're live. No, no big deal. I'll, I'll, I'll talk to the people in the chat. By the way, I hope everybody's having a great summer. You can see half my face. Let me scooch over. I hope everybody's having a great summer. Thank you guys uh, for being here. Thank you guys for all the support. Um, let me see. Uh, Aaron says, hey, guys, what do you think needs to be seen in preseason to show the team is going at the right direction? And who do you think will be calling plays? Um, first off, I just took over Patty's channel again. So that's awesome. Welcome to the Entertainment Talk and Sports. No, all kidding aside, as far as um, what I need to see in preseason, Aaron, and um, who do I think will be calling plays? I, I think it's going to be Cop is going to be calling plays. I, I've said back? that. Can you hear me, Chris? Um, I, I think you're back. I think you're oh, back. Got the wrong screen. All right, good. I'm back. <laughs> as, as, as far as uh, your question, I think it's going to be Kafka calling plays. What I'm looking forward to in preseason, I mean, what I what I look forward to in every preseason, uh, the most important thing is remaining healthy, more so than anything else. Get out of there healthy. Um, I think Dable is going to probably play his starters a bit more, at least I hope a bit more in the preseason games than Judge did. Judge didn't play the starters at all for the most part last year, which I, I was I found a bit concerning going into the year. Um, but, yeah, you want them to pick up the playbook. You want to see how they look in the offense, so on and so forth. But the most important thing when it comes to preseason to me, remain healthy. Uh, that That's my biggest concern going into the preseason. Get out of there relatively healthy. Um, but, yeah, obviously there's new playbooks on either side of the ball. So there's going to be a lot of learning. Um, and, and we'll see how they do week one. But it's hard to judge a team based off the preseason. I could go back to, I think it's like 2018. I, I don't remember what year it was. Maybe it was 2019. The Giants went undefeated in preseason, and then they won like four games. So uh, preseason doesn't mean much to me in terms of what you see in terms of the wins and losses. But 
get out of there healthy and hopefully they, they pick up the playbook. Okay. I think I'm back. Can you hear me now, folks? I think you're good to go. You know, I don't, <laughs> I'm telling you, I keep saying this and I'm going to, seriously, I, I mean, I apologize folks, but I've got to switch to the darn new laptop that I have sitting upstairs. I've had this new laptop since September, 2020, I want to say. And my husband keeps saying, when are you going to switch? When are you going to switch? I said, oh, I like the other laptop, the one that I'm using now has everything set up the way I want with the, you know, passwords and everything like that with my shortcuts. And my husband's like, just do it. He says, you won't have the problems that you've been having with writing your show, with having to sit perfectly still during your podcast. I'm like, it's annoying. Uh, though. I'm with you. It's annoying when you get something it, new. It after. really is. It really is you, because you get so used to it. You're like, I don't want to have to download uh, all these apps all over again. And I'm with you. I'm with you on that. And that's I'm telling you, and I beat my laptops to to a pulp. I mean, but I think I'm I have I have to do it at some point. I mean, I, gotta make I I'll make my life so much easier if I if I do it. But anyway, I apologize, folks, uh, and I appreciate your patience. And Chris, I I appreciate you carrying the the fort while I'm <laughs> going on. My dad um, asked, uh, my dad asked, can we beat the Titans, Cowboys, Packers, or Ravens? All right, I'm gonna diagnose each game. Sure. I don't like I don't like the Titans matchup. It's on the road. It's week Agreed. one. Um, it's, it's an experienced coach with Vrabel an experienced football team. It's kind of like the first matchup with judge, even though that was a bit worse because there was no, no preseason, um, because of COVID. Um, uh, so it, it kind of has that vibe to it because Tomlin was going up against judge Yeah, you know, so I don't like that matchup, especially being on the road. I don't think we're going to win that the Ravens matchup. I hate because you're coming back on short rest after the London game. Um, I don't like that matchup. I don't think we're winning that game. Uh, Packers, same. I'm not picking us to beat the Packers. I do think the Cowboys, we can pick off. I think we could beat the Cowboys once. Um, not saying it's going to happen, but out of those four games, I think the Cowboys, we stand the best chance. Yeah, I'm I'm with you on that. Same reasoning, by the way. Um, yeah. Now, it would be nice if the, if the Giants can go two and two in those first four games. I'll take that. I'd be very, very happy with that. Who do, I know we play the Panthers week two. Bears. We and Cowboys there. is I I think it's Titans, Panthers, Bears, and Cowboys. Two and two is good, and then I got to start in two and four because I got to lose into the Packers and lose into the Ravens. But we do have that really soft part of our schedule. Right, you got Seattle. Although Seattle's on the road, I think they can take Seattle. Yeah, and they have Jacksonville, don't they? We play Jacksonville. We play the Lions. I think four and four is 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 possible to start the season, don't you? I think it's possible. Yeah, I think I do. I think I think four and four because because we we hit that soft part of our schedule. It's at least possible. Yeah, sure. I mean the only thing that kind of concerns me is the Giants. You know, having to go cross country to see, they they haven't played well in Seattle historically. Um, so that makes me a little. Although you know Seattle is kind of not what they once were. Um, the Ravens matchup scares me, like for the reasons you said. Uh, coming back from London. And not having the bye week, I think uh, it's a disaster waiting to happen. I, and, and I pray I'm wrong, but I don't. I, I hope you. I hope if so. we're going to get blown I out in any wrong. game. Like if you said, Chris, going into the year, the Giants are going to have one game where they lose by thirty points. That would be the game I'd pick. I, I hate all the variables going into that game. Yeah, yeah. Not to mention some of the matchups that they have. Lamar Jackson destroyed us last time. Oh, around. the running. Yeah. Oh yeah. my gosh. Yeah. So you know that that game concerns me. The Titans game. You know, it's interesting. I was talking, you know, off kind of like like this with the, our Locked on Titans host. And he goes, I won't admit this ever to my listeners. But he says, I think the Giants can beat, can win that game. I think I we says, could. Um, I, I mean, you us, know. I think we could. You got to line up and play. I mean. You know, I mean, so. last year, I mean, we beat the Panthers when they were kind of starting to get hot. And people thought we had no chance. We beat the Raiders who ended up making the playoffs. And we beat um, – who else? I thought we beat another pretty good team. I can't remember off the top of my head, but yeah, I wouldn't be shocked if the Giants pull an upset against the Titans. I'm not going to predict it. Yeah, um, I'm with you. I, I'd say like 80, 20 or 75, 25 in terms of our chances, but we could win that game. Yes. I mean, you never know. That's why you line up and that's why you play the game. So, yeah. all right, let's talk about the defensive line. Yeah. Now, a couple years ago, I was crowing and I was saying, Defensive line is the unquestionable strength of this Giants team. Mm -hmm. And then they lost Dalvin Tomlinson. And I thought the line took a hit. 
Austin Johnson played well in, in, in his place and he's gone. Are you concerned just a smidge about that defensive line or, or am I just being paranoid here? No, I don't think you're being paranoid. I, I think we clearly have a potential issue in the interior part of the D-line. Um, it's going to be interesting to see what they do with Dexter Lawrence this year, whether they shuffle him in in the middle a bit more than they have in the past. Um, but I think we have much bigger concerns elsewhere on this roster. Um, I still think it's at least a pretty good defensive line, especially when you factor in what you hope is an improved outside uh, pass rusher uh, with Thibodeau. So – I wouldn't consider it a weakness, but it may not necessarily be a strength or at least as big of a strength as it's been in the past. Yeah. And I was a bit surprised, even though I know we drafted, uh, I can't remember the guy's name off the top of my head. We did draft the defensive tackle in this year's draft, but it was Davidson. Like the, Davidson. Yeah. It was like the fifth round. Uh, yep. I thought we'd probably address that a bit earlier in this year's draft. Cause I do see it as being a potential issue uh, long-term for this football team. So, I worry a bit about it, but I think there's much bigger areas of concern on this on this roster. Well, kind of like what they did with the offensive line, where they brought in veterans that know the system. Yeah. Kind of did the same thing on the defensive line. Jihad Ward, Justin Ellis. You know, these are guys, I, if I'm not mistaken, had connections to, to yeah, Ellis Martin I think now. played with uh, the Ravens, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think that's – it's the same philosophy. We, I call it the corporate trainer uh, type of – approach you know it's like you open up a new restaurant and you bring down corporate trainers to show the new staff how to do things and then the trainers go away and then the staff the, the long-term staff takes over that's how i look at it so uh you know um we'll see i mean but that unit i, I don't want to say it's a concern but it's it's definitely not the strength in my opinion as of right now it's it's early but i think it, i don't think it's the strength I think uh, the strength potentially could be for this team. It, it could edge. be, but I'm not going to say it's, no, it's, I think it's the a edge, slam dunk I strength. Be, I think the edge is going to could be the strength with, uh, with obviously uh, with the addition of Thibodeau. I think our edge rushers could potentially be a strength for this football team, which is something you have not been able to say for a really long time. Right, right, all right. Aaron Tobol asks, "What do you think about the Panthers trading for Baker?" Can I be honest here? I mean, look, Baker, he's not a horrible quarterback, no. but. I got to be honest with you. When the when when he was coming out in the draft and everybody's saying, "Oh, the Giants should take Baker Mayfield," I was not on board with that. I don't know why, but there was just something about Baker that I was like, "I hope the Giants don't go that direction." Yeah. Um, Baker, I, I, you know, he's when he's good, he's really good, and when he's not, he's just you, you just want to rip your hair out. So he's just too. <laughs> consistent for my taste and yeah let's be honest uh and, and I, I was a baker fan i like this personality coming out um uh but let's be honest baker mayfield i think became the number one overall pick mainly because he was a cheerleader there yeah. were several other quarterbacks in that draft that you could have definitely argued had a much higher ceiling than baker mayfield did um people talked about the intangible so on and so forth some giants fans wanted the giants to trade for baker not me baker mayfield to me is never going to be a long-term answer um, I just don't think he possesses the upside as a guy that I'd be comfortable handing a five-year contract to. Um, he had a perfect situation in Cleveland. He's, he wouldn't have that with the New York Giants. I don't think he's going to have that with Carolina. Their offensive line, they did draft the Quanu, should be improved, but it's still definitely not a strength of that football team. But, it, I mean, it wasn't a bad move. They gave up almost nothing to get him. I think they gave up, like, a conditional fifth-round pick. Um, mm -hmm. Best of luck to Baker. I, I, yeah. I don't. I don't think he's going to be incredibly successful with that football team, though. But maybe they win eight or nine games. It is a yeah, weekend. And, and that coaching staff is on the hot seat this year because if they don't win, I suspect Rule is out. Rule's gone. I mean, you look I, at I, the I, draft capital they've given up to get Donald and Mayfield, and and they've had opportunities to yeah. draft quarterbacks and they've passed up on it. And um, yeah. yeah, I think uh, I think Rule's on the hot seat. They got to at least have a winning year or maybe eight wins for him to retain his job. I think so too. All right. NY Giants 26. I'm extremely excited for Bellinger. What have you seen out of him so far? I like this kid a lot. Can I just yeah. say, I like him a lot. Good route runner, smooth hands like fly paper. What I haven't seen from him yet is the blocking because obviously in, in the spring, there's no contact. But I like what I saw from the kid. I like how they were deploying him. I think he's going to surprise. I think he's going to be one of those draft picks where, where you say, wow, I didn't expect that to come out of him, you know, because he's just going to be that more, that much productive, I think, in this offense. Yeah. Uh, 
he was one of the picks I was most excited about when we made it after I did research. I didn't know a whole hell of a lot about him uh, before we drafted him, but he's the exact type of tight end I wanted. I mean, he's got the athletic potential. He ran a four, six, seven. He's known to be a really good blocker. It was the type of tight end that we needed. So I'm really excited. And I think he's going to be the starting tight end. I think he's going to get that crack. He doesn't have a whole lot of competition. So I think he's going to be utilized year one, kind of like the way that Kevin Boss was. Um, you know, mm-hmm. later on. Good comparison. Time. Yeah. So I think he's going to be better than Boss because Boss, yep. there was no way in hell Boss was running four, six, seven. Yeah. Um, but I think he potentially could be better than Boss. But I, I think he's going to have a, an immediate impact for this football team. Yeah, I, I agree with you. All right, Aaron Tobol, do you think we should keep Slayton after all the injuries last year? Mm, you know what? That's a tough sell for me. Um, Darius Slayton, by the way, also had some injuries. Uh, I don't think a lot of people talk about that, but he he had, he was banged up the last couple of years as well. Um, what I saw from Slayton, and this is just my observation, I thought at times last year his confidence waned a little bit. Now, this spring... I thought the confidence was coming back. Mm -hmm. I thought he was starting to look a little bit better. Like, you know, he was as a rookie. Um, But here's the problem I have. 2.5 million cap hit doesn't play special teams. Mm -hmm. And yeah, there's injuries at receiver, but you know, you mean to tell me you can't find somebody who's a little cheaper to, to to fill that, to fill that role. I mean, you know, the, it's interesting that this team, they should be able to get through the year. It's going to be tight, but their cap situation, once all the cuts or projected cuts are made, they should be okay. I don't know that it would be good value to keep a guy 2.5 million who doesn't play special teams and who potentially is your fourth or fifth receiver. Cause you know, you figure, okay, Galladay Shepard's hurt, but I think at some point he's going to come back. you got Tony um, you got Wandale Robinson. So if those four guys are, are on the field, do you really you want your option. fifth guy making yeah. 2.5 and not playing specials? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm i for keeping them um, this year personally, um, but I wouldn't. it's not like I'm going to scream if they get rid of him. Because, and I think if they do get rid of him, it's mainly due to the salary. Um, like you said, they feel like he's not going to have much of an impact on this team due to the fact that he's the fifth receiver on this team. But – I look at our receiving core and I see a lot of guys with potential injury concerns, Shepard, Galladay, um, Tony. So I, I could see the value in keeping him for this year and not to mention in the past, he has shown good chemistry with Daniel Jones, but I'm, I'm definitely not sold on him being a giant after this year. I think if he, if he does remain on with the team, I think this will be his last year as a New York giant. Well, he's, um, he's in his final year of his contracts. So. Yeah. I don't think they'll bring him back. Yeah. Um, yeah. We'll see. He's going to be an interesting guy to keep an eye on whether or not he makes this team. In the end, I'm leaning. He's a good will, camp, but we'll see. Yeah, I mean, he he needs a good camp. Plain yeah. and simple. Um, but you know, the salary look that that's a benefit of him playing as much as he he did. You know, that was escalators that kicked in those player performance incentives and whatnot. So um, we'll see. I mean, I, I I don't think he makes it, but we'll see. I, I wouldn't. I'm not ready to to say. I would be slam shocked dunk. if he doesn't. Yeah, I I'm I'm not ready to say slam dunk. Mark him down. He's out. Yeah. All right. Side Bry, side guy Bry asks, how much does it cost to resurface an NFL? I have no idea. I think I know where you're going with this. The Giants are not replacing that field. They just replaced that field. I think it was 2019. I'd be stunned if there were plans to replace the turf. Um, And and again, I think to resurface an NFL field, are you talking grass? Are you talking AstroTurf? What what surface are you talking about? You know, you're talking about the rug, like they used to have the old uh, veteran stadium. So it's hard to give you an answer there, Brian. I I just don't know the what what it would cost i think you would have to i think if you google like uh, the different surfaces or the different stadiums and see you know that that can maybe give you a, a rough idea what it costs so um you know but uh, sorry i don't have an exact answer for you so. I, I just looked it up um the whole process of removing the old turf disposing recycling and then resurfacing the field costs between 620,000 and 1.1 million that's a met life I don't know about MetLife. I just Googled it. So that's, that's. What oh, yeah. But I think it's going to vary though, according to the type of surface that they, they put down. I could yeah. be wrong, but you know, uh, natural, oh, natural grass, forget it. Cyber. I mean, that, that, that would, 
They try, you, a lot of people don't remember this, but they actually tried working with grass trays at the old giant stadium and it didn't work. You had two football teams, two pro football teams. You had college football. You had concerts. You had events. It didn't hold up. And I don't know if you remember, but back in the day when they had the grass fields, they were constantly replacing the trays, and it got to be really ridiculously expensive. And they finally said, you know what? We're going back to the turf. Yeah. So, yeah, grass would be very difficult to maintain. And then, you know, you got the weather on top of it. You know, if you get a downpour or a snow, oh, just, I, I don't know, man. The, the answer would have been to put a, a roof over that building. I don't know why they didn't, but it is. They, they should have at least had a retractable roof. Yeah. yeah. I yeah. agree with that. I mean, I, I, I'm stunned. They, they they went for broke on it. They might as well have finished it off and put the roof on it, you know. But um, all right. Let's see. Uh, Tyrone uh, Tyrone Bauman says it's not the turf. These guys are putting heavy wear and tear on their ligaments. You, you know, good point. I was Tyrone. I actually asked a uh, former NFL trainer about this. And uh, he said, you know, think about it. You're stopping and you're starting and you're accelerating and cutting. And the other thing um, that was suggested to me is that guys are so intent on being, you know, having low body fat and to a degree body fat protects your ligaments. I'm not sure. Again, I'm not sure of the sports science behind it, but it does protect your ligaments somewhat. Um, whereas if you have no protection, now you're exposing it. So I, I'm, I'm not sure how it works, but uh, somebody told me that some, some players are just so intent on, on having like as close as possible and no body fat. And it's just not necessarily the best way to go. I don't know what the what the problem is when it comes to our injuries. I don't think it's exclusively the turf, like some Giants fans lead it. I on. don't think it is either. Um, it, I think that may be part of it, but I don't think it's I don't think it's the only or maybe even the the primary reason because the Jets play in the same field. Jets didn't have near the amount of injuries. That yes, exactly. Good point. Time. Good point. Um, so I think it, it may be a factor, but I don't think it's the primary factor. It also could be that these guys aren't resting. You know, I mean. This is the other thing I don't understand. You know, I know in past regimes, they would go out, they would practice. After practice, what did they do? They'd go in and they'd lift. Yeah. You've just been out on the field for 90 minutes, pushing guys around, running, you know, exerting yourself. And now you're going to go in and you're going to lift. Yeah. I never understood the, the logic behind that. If there's any trainers out there or, or you know, doctors or anything, please drop me a line and explain that to me what the logic is behind lifting weights after you're out there doing aerobics and involving pushing heavy things and and, and people i don't get it i yeah. thought you 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 recover you rest and you recover and do some post stretch uh post practice stretching and you know Hopefully that's the, hopefully that's, I, the, I thought that's how you do it, but I mean, what do I know? I mean, you, you, you alluded to the, that's what Dable's doing. And hopefully that, yeah. that means we have a lot less injuries this year. Yeah. All right. Aaron T Tobel, do you think Julian Love can hold down the safety position or is Dane Belton going to get some starting reps? You know, the term starter, that's such a mis that, that That's such an overused term in football because starter means you're out there for the first play. I think yeah. it's going to vary. I think what you're going to see is you're going to see Julian Love get a lot of snaps, but you're also going to see D Dane Belton get his share of snaps. I'd, I'd be, I think, you know, maybe not or in the beginning, but I could see him getting some snaps as we go on. Absolutely. Yeah. I think Love will definitely be the starter to start the year. Um, but yeah, I think Belton's going to get an opportunity at some point. He's a, he's a guy, when you look at him, definitely fits the type of defense that I think Link would, would want to run. He's a versatile player, just like Love. Um, but yeah, I do think Belton will get some playing time for sure as the, as the season progresses. I see GM's uh, JM saying losing contributes to injuries too. I agree with that. Oh um, yeah, 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 yep, All you got to do is look here. at Kenny Galladay last year. I mean, I think he oh quit, yeah, he quit on business the team decisions. last three or four weeks. Um, yeah, it becomes like a business decision. They're like, ah, we're not, we're, not, we're not doing much anyway. Why am I going to put my body on the line? You know, for a team that's not going to win. You know, we're not going to the playoffs. I got to think about my contract next year. So yeah, I agree with that. Losing definitely. Absolutely, totally agree with that. All right, folks, got one more commercial. It's a quick one. I got to run, and then we'll just continue taking your questions and talking Giants as we get you ready for Giants training camp. So we'll be right back. Hey, Giant fans, betonline.net is the only place that offers the best information on the latest odds, contests, and player props for all your sports betting needs. No matter what sport you're into, betonline.net has you covered. Plus, 
They offer everything you need to know for live betting and your favorite Vegas casino games. So head on on head on over to betonline.net today to learn more about the trends and the action. Bet online where the games start. All right. Welcome back, everybody. That will do it for the commercials for today. Thank you for your patient patience. All right. Uh, let me see. Um, while we were on break, uh, Sinner Giants um, checked in on uh, with a response to my question. Uh, I was a personal trainer and it has to do with working all the different muscle groups. Lifting isolates the muscles and helps to prevent further injury. All right. I, I'll take your word for it because again, that's not my area of expertise. I just don't understand if you're, if you've been out on the field and you've been working your muscles, um, pushing up against guys, you know, offensive versus offensive line versus defensive line. I, I, I don't know. To me, it just seems like overkill, but I'm sure there's some kind of science behind it. I'm not, you know, I'm not going to sit here and, and, and say, oh, you know, that's the reason why I don't know. I think, I think part of the, the problem with injuries is just bad luck. Um, that's you know, definitely part of Saquon it. Barkley, I mean, he got his injury happened on grass for heaven's sake. So you oh, know. The, the, the Saquon Barkley injury last year was just a complete freak. Thing. And that was a free, right. Exactly. That was a fluke injury. You know, um, part of it could also be, you know, technique. You look at Daniel Jones's injury, you know, you're going to put your head down and you're going to try and bolt fo forward with your shoulder. And, and no. when you have a defender coming at you, I mean, you know, the, what are the odds? That's I mean, I, I was I was saying it last year. I kept saying, my gosh, if he keeps doing that, he's going to get dinged, and he got dinged twice. He's got uh, he you know, that's he better get better at that. Otherwise, he ain't get he is not going to be in the league too long if he keeps playing like that. He's got to get much better at that. You know, and and that's why I asked, and and I didn't like the answer. You know, I I know people are going to say, well, what do you expect him to say? You know, how do you look at film to figure that stuff out? It's just I I, I just. It's instinctual. It's it's, you, it's instincts exactly. exactly. Yeah, you got you, you you he and listen. I was and he doesn't the game. Have I was excited as anybody else when he bowled over Grady Jarrett. But you do not want your quarterback doing that because no. it's going to lend itself to injuries. He he's got to get better at that. That's something the Giants need to be instilling in his head um, this offseason. Get down. Be smarter. Um, make make better decisions when it comes to putting your body on the line. Can't do that. Well, you know what? Here's here's a thought, Chris. I wondered if at times he just did that because he figured, okay, you know what? My teammates aren't as good as you know to, to where. Oh, I, I think that definitely. I, I think maybe he he felt. Let me take it on my upon myself to make the plays that aren't being made. Maybe that was part of it. I don't know. I definitely think that's part of it. Um, is that he feels he needs to go above and beyond at times to try to win football games. He feels the pressure. Um, but you gotta be smarter. You gotta get down. You gotta, you gotta get out of bat. You can't take some of the hits he's taken. And, and here's the other thing, you know, and I hate to say this because his, his running is, can be such a, an asset, but you've got running backs. You've got people who can do that. Maybe don't rely on him as much to do some of that stuff. A cut, cut down and, you know, find some kind of balance to where, you don't have to call on him to run the ball five times, you know, a game because you, I mean, if your quarterback is, is your leading rusher, that's a problem that, that, that bothers me. I mean, I know that's Baltimore Lamar Jackson is up there as a leading rusher. I know down in, in Arizona, I think Kyler Murphy, Kyler Murray, um, you but know, they're smarter when they run with the football, but they're, exactly. You, if you're smart, it, it'll work. I don't see the instincts in Daniel Jones. I mean, when I, I go back to um, the, the training camp scuffle last year, remember that big scuffle they had and yeah. who was at the bottom of the pile, mixing it up, Daniel Jones. And you're sitting there going, dude, what are you doing? Yeah. What are you yeah. doing? He's, he's, you know? he's got, that's, that's definitely one area where he has to get a lot better uh, for, for his long-term potential career. I mean, he suffered what many felt could have been a career debilitating injury last year. He's, he's got to be smarter with the football when it, when it, when he takes off and runs with it. Um, And I hope, uh, he runs a little bit less this year. And and part of me is like, with hopefully an improved offensive scheme, he won't feel the need to run as much. They won't feel the need to call as many running plays because they'll be yeah. able to play bigger plays in the passing game. Yeah. Um, that's what I hope. I, I think under Garrett and Judge, like the offense was so hopeless that Jones was really their only hope in terms of his legs at times to be able to create big plays. And hopefully with an improved offensive play caller, um, and he puts these receivers in the best uh, situation, to be successful, Jones won't take it upon himself to run the ball as much. Absolutely. All right. Jerry 
geriatric, geriatric, that's clever. <laughs> what happened, whatever happened to the international player the Giants picked up? Has he been practicing with the team, the old lineman, whose last name I asked oh, him. Oh, the guy that, um, Roy, uh, I can't say his last name. I, I, and you know, I went up to him and I asked him how to, how you pronounce it. And he was so nice. He, he said, okay. He says it's, it's three syllables and he sounded it out and I still can't get it. And I don't want to butcher it, but he says, he, my goodness, that young man, he is a big, big He's six, nine, isn't he? He is really, t- I was like, wow. I, I'm, and he went to shake my hand and I thought he was going to snap my, you know, crush it, but he was so gentle. So really sweetheart of a guy. Um, yes. He's, he's been practicing with the team. He will continue to practice. I think they've got a uh, roster exemption for him. You're not going to see him this year. He's, he's raw. He's, he's got some work to do. So, uh, no you know, offense kind of, to him. I hope we never see him because we have Evan Neal and Andrew Thomas on, on, well, as, you want a swing tackle. Yeah. Yeah. You need a swing I, tackle. I, I'm not saying I don't want to make the 53 man roster. Right, right. I don't want to see him in the starting lineup because, I mean, look what we invested in those two guys. Yeah. But, well, I, I, um, I yeah. Exactly. You never know. I mean, look at the guy that the Eagles brought in that was an international, uh, tackle. Yeah. Jordan Metallia, I think it was. Yeah. So yeah. we'll see. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Uh, Aaron Tobel with another question. Do you, if the majority of our receiving core is healthy, do you think we can put up a lot of points? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I think we're going to put up a lot more points this year. I'll say that. I, I, I agree. I think we're going to turn it over a lot more too, because I think we're going to be aggressive, which you need to be. I yeah. don't mind the turnovers if it results in more points. You can't win football games playing the way that the New York Giants have over the previous two seasons. Um, so, yeah, I mean, Dable's come out and said it. He, he wants Daniel Jones to go out there and wing it. Um, and I think he will. I, I think Danny Jones is going to have a lot more passing attempts than he's had in recent years. Um, and there's going to be times where you scratch your head and you say, how did he make that throw? Um, but at the same time, it should lend itself to some bigger plays. So I think we'll put more points on the board this year. No doubt about it. I hope so. Because the offense last, last year was a snoozer. It was, was an horrible. absolute snoozer. <laughs> uh, let's see. I got a question here from a magistrate Williams. When do you think Giants will get a new stadium? MetLife has run its course. MetLife was, it opened in 2010, so it's not that old of a stadium. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm I, with you, Williams. Like, I'm, I was very disappointed with the stadium, um, especially for a new stadium. Like, I look at City Field, for example. I love it. Like, the Mets built that stadium right around the same time as the Giants did. I think it's one of the better ballparks in baseball. The Giants stadium, uh, a complete letdown. Well, but like you said. What did they invest like 1.2, 1.3 billion dollars into that stadium? They're not going to just knock that. Yeah, but down. here's the problem. Here was the problem with that that stadium. You had two teams with very different visions as to what each team wanted the stadium to look like. Right. And there had to be compromises, and some of the compromises, aka the gray seating area, the look of the the stadium. I think somebody somebody compared it to what like a toaster oven or something like that. Or it looks a like a seat. You know what it looks like from the outside. My initial impression when I first went there. It looked like a CD, the CD racks. Yeah. From the outside. Well, I'm just it. saying, like, I, I remember, and, and I know this from doing my research um, when I wrote my book, the Giants wanted it to look, almost have like a modern type of field, like the polo grounds. I don't mm. know. I, I don't remember what the polo grounds look like off the top of my head, but that the Giants kind of wanted that. The Jets wanted something different and they had a compromise. And when you have two different teams with, with different histories and different visions and ideas, you're, you're going to have to meet in the middle. And unfortunately the middle is going to be kind of bland. And, and, you know, if it had been purely giants, the giants building the building, I think it would have been a much better facility. Oh, hands down. It couldn't be much worse. I mean, I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a fan of the facility at the end of the day though, if they win, I'll forget about the stadium. Well, you know, com- compared to the old Giant Stadium, I know a lot of people don't want to hear this, but having walked around the the tunnel, the old Giant Stadium, and it was modernized. The, yeah. the 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 new MetLife Stadium is 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 a lot more modern. Mm-hmm. Um, from a fan's perspective, I like to watch a con well concert is probably different because of the seating being different, but I could see why people would would you know feel the way they they do about that stadium. The other thing is, remember, they've got to flip it, you know, so it's got to be blue for the Giants games and green for, yeah. the, for, for the Jack games. And it, everything is flippable in that building. So, for example, in the press box, they have these big, like, murals of giant grates. Well, you flip them over, now you've got jet grates. So they, they have to flip stuff around. And 
you know, even the, the parking flags, you know, when you first come into the parking tolls, I mean, there's just so much that goes into converting that stadium. And here's the thing, Chris, you know, what's kind of weird is you wonder with all the money that they've spent over the years, having to flip the stadium back and forth, could they have put a roof on it or could they have even built another stadium? I don't know. Yeah. And I, I think the other thing is, you know, you look around the league and you see all these other new stadiums and you're like, what? Like, what were the Giants thinking? Like, you look at the Cowboys stadium, you look at, and I understand taxes in Dallas are a lot different than taxes in New York. Um, but you look at, you look at the new Raiders stadium, you look at the, all of them blow our stadium away. And I think fans see that and they say, what the hell were the Giants thinking when they built what they built? Um, but at the end of the day, I don't care what my stadium looks like. If we win football games, we could play, exactly. we, we could play at a high school stadium for all I care. If the Giants are winning 11, 12 games, I'm not going to complain. It's the same thing with the jerseys. Um, I think fans look for things to complain about when the team sucks. They're like, well, let's look to improve the stadium. Let's look to improve the jerseys. If the Giants put a winning product out there, I, I don't care what they could be wearing trash bags. If they win 12 games, I don't <laughs> care. That's my mindset. Just one. Hey, I, I, I agree with you. You know, it's like you do, you, you nitpick. It's like, nobody's going to notice if confetti's flying down because we're celebrating, you know, which NFC championship or, or you know, birth to the Super Bowl or whatnot. Uh, all right. Papa Guzzo. Does Daniel Jones pass for over 4,000 yards? My gosh, I hope so. I hope so. This offense, I think, would set him up for that. Um, I if think he plays he's... 17 games, I think he does. I think so, too. But I don't I, hope he's going to play 17 games. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think I, I think you're going to see, you know, again, the idea is to get the ball into the hands of the playmakers, let them do their thing, and there's going to be deep shots taken because, you know, Daniel's strength is is the deep ball. And it's not a strength that they, they were able to do a whole lot of because, remember, he didn't have a good offensive line and he was constantly under duress. I think they're optimistic that they will be able to get some more deep passes in there. It's not going to be like, oh, he's going to throw, you know, five or six or ten times deep down the field every every game. It's going to be selected spots. But, um, yeah, I, I could see him throwing for 4,000 yards if he stays healthy and if that offensive line holds up. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that, like I said, I think they're going to throw a lot more this year than they have in previous years. So that in itself should lend itself to more yards passing. And, um, yeah, I think 4,000 yards is very obtainable in a 17-game season. I don't think that's crazy. I mean, Kerry Collins did it back in uh, 2000. He threw for over 4,000 yards when – teams weren't thrown nearly as much as they do today in a 16 game season. So yeah. if Jones could stay on the field and they're not nearly as conservative as, they, as they've been in the last two years, I see no reason why he can't throw for 4,000 yards. I just, I highly question whether or not he can stay on the field for 17 games. That's my biggest question. One of my biggest questions with, with Daniel Jones, because again, the the running and the, and, and the need to show that he's tough and, you know, it's like, dude, just be there for your team. You know, yeah. You could show you're tough in other ways. You don't have to take blows to the head or to the neck area or, or, or you know, pick up that extra yard be, by knocking somebody over. I mean, come on, be smart about it. And, and especially, like you said, he has no instincts. And, you know, that's actually one of the questions I want to get to the coaching staff is, can you even teach a guy to have instincts? I don't know that you can. I think you just have to develop them. Yeah, and, and – I, I think we've learned as Giants fans over the last couple of years is you don't want to make Jones too much like a robot either. I think Judge kind of did that um, in terms of like program, program, programming him not to turn the football over. And I think it's you kind of don't want to do that either when he's running the football. Don't put it in his head too much. Oh, you need to go. You know, he like you said, that's something that he needs to pick up over the course of time. And I don't know if he's going to be able to do that. That's instincts. Um, yeah. And if he can't. Well then, don't run the football. <laughs> you exactly. only only run the only run the football when it when there's a clear path to be able to uh, take off and get yourself ten or fifteen yards to get out of bounds because you can't keep taking the hits you've been taking. All right, I want to put this this uh, statement by Crispy up on the uh, on the screen because this is actually something I saw a debate about. If we kept Pat Shermer for another year, Jones would have already proven he's our guy. Now I've had some people actually debate this and say, you know, Pat Shermer. Yeah, he wasn't a great head coach, but as an offensive coordinator and considering what he was able to do with Daniel in, in Daniel's rookie year was encouraging. So let me ask you this, Chris. Do you think had the Giants been able to somehow keep Shermer, and I know, you know, once he was fired as head coach, it wasn't happening. Do you think maybe things would have been different for Daniel? 
you go back and watch my channel, guys, whoever's listening. Um, I was one of the few people that I remember that was hoping Pat Shermer stayed. I didn't want them to fire Pat Shermer. Um, and this was the only reason why. <laughs> I thought it would completely screw up the development of Daniel Jones. I don't know if Jones would have proven he's the guy had Shermer not moved on, but I definitely think he would have been a, he would have been a much better quarterback um, than he was under Joe Judge. I mean, you drafted Daniel Jones to fit the Pat Shermer offense. He was a guy that Pat Shermer felt fit very well into the offense that he was looking to run. And then you fired him after one year with Daniel Jones and expected Jones to just pick up where he left off under a completely different, uh, it couldn't have been more polar opposite in terms of the offensive philosophy with Jason Garrett. So I definitely think that screwed up Jones. That was my biggest fear when Giants fans were talking about running Pat Shermer out of town. The Giants issue with me, I completely understand why they fired Pat Shermer. He's a bad football coach. But if you knew, if you're John Mara and you knew you were going to fire Pat Shermer if the team won five games or four games or whatever it was, like they did in Daniel Jones' rookie year, you shouldn't have allowed Pat Shermer to pick a quarterback because it completely screwed with him after you got rid of Pat Shermer. So there's my issue. Once you allowed Pat Shermer to handpick the quarterback for the New York Giants that you thought was going to be the next Eli Manning, you can't fire him after one year. Yeah, you have to give Daniel Jones the the ability to be able to grow as a quarterback. So once they took that leap, once they took Daniel Jones sixth overall, that should have been the primary focus of the Giants organization. Let's put Jones in the best possible situation to succeed. And the best possible situation for him to succeed year two was to build off of what he had already done under Pat Shermer. So I do yep. think I find Pat Shermer screwed up Daniel Jones a lot. And, you know, again, the Giants admitted we did a lot to screw this kid up. That was certainly, I think, a big one. Yeah. You know, because, I mean, now, obviously, you know, you weren't going to say to Pat Shermer after firing, you know, hey, Pat, you know, you're not working out as head coach, but we want you to stay on as offensive. Oh, you had to stay on as the head coach if you were going to keep him. Exactly. Now, you could you could have maybe, I don't know, done some other stuff. I'm not sure how they could have made it work. Um, but, uh, that's the whole reason why I think they, they brought in Pat Shermer because you look at what he had done in Cleveland with, with a couple guys who, who, you know, just weren't near the pedigree of Daniel Jones and he had success with them, modest success. Uh, now some people will say, well, he wasn't able to make much with, with Drew Locke out in Denver. And, you know, it, that that's, you know, you can sit there and you can debate it, but I, I think that was a big, you know. When you when you Mistake. draft the quarterback, especially one that high, the the main reason why Sherman was brought in the first place is like kind of what you alluded to is his success with prior quarterbacks. You don't then get rid of that guy after one year. So yep. I, I thought it was a massive mistake on the Giants' part after they had already drafted Daniel Jones to move on. Well, from that and the fact that they didn't have things set up for Daniel Jones, they didn't have an offensive line, they didn't really have you know. Solid and let's receivers. be real, the defense was the primary problem. I mean, James Betcher, the defense was horrible. And they, Betcher, had, no, uh, and they had no talent on that side of the ball. Yep. Like, if had you – here's what I'll say. Had you brought Shermer back, and I don't think Shermer would have ever been a Super Bowl winning head coach. I don't think this team was ever going to win more than eight games or so in Shermer's third year. But had you brought Shermer back, had you improved the defensive coordinator on the other side of the ball and brought in the same additions that you did with Bradbury. Say you brought in Patrick Graham. I don't know if he would have came, but say you brought in Patrick Graham, you brought in James Bradbury, you brought brought in Blake Martinez. I think that team would have won eight games. There wouldn't have been a learning curve for Jones having to switch schemes. I think the offense would have gelled a lot better. It is what it is. You can't go back in the past, but I I think the Giants mishandled that situation. I completely understood the firing of Shermer, but I don't think they should have. If they knew they were going to fire Shermer, then they shouldn't have drafted a quarterback. Yeah. It it just, I don't know. I mean, hopefully moving forward, the Giants – do things in, in seek logical order. I just think some of the things that they've done in the past were done, you know, you, you sit there and you say, why are you doing that when you should be, you know, it, it just, it, it just seemed like it was out of order. Yeah. That there were, that there were I mean, Mara decisions made it. That, that made you say, what are you doing? Mara admitted to it. He said they he did. He screwed absolutely. up the development of Daniel Jones. And I think it starts there. That's where it started to get screwed up. Yeah, absolutely. You, you know, the offensive line, not, not, not addressing i mean i understand you know yes at some point you want to let the young guys play but you had nothing in reserve to, to in case those guys you know you had veterans okay big deal they were signed for to one year deal i just didn't understand it i i, I mean 
I don't know. I mean, that that's why I don't get paid the big bucks to make those decisions and other people do, but some of the, the moves were just head scratchers. And then, you know, you, you cap strap the team yeah. to where, you know, now Shane figured out a way to, to make it work. I don't know, you know, it remains to be seen how well he makes it work here, but just some of the decisions from the management level just make you just want to scream. Yeah. <laughs> so hopefully it's getting better. And I, oh, I, yeah. And so far it looks good. I, I, I have learned from the past because I'm a fan. I got hyped up with Judge, right? He was a guy you got excited about. Young coach. New York Giants seem like they're doing things differently. I am taking a much more reserved approach this time around. But what I'll say so far, you're one. And you could definitely argue that it's been obvious things. But regardless, I like things that Joe Shane has done. He didn't Me back too. his salaries. I love the first two picks that he made. And, yeah, I could have made those picks. A, a drunk sailor could have made those picks. But he made the pick. <laughs> he addressed the two biggest needs. And he took arguably the two best players in the entire draft with the Giants' two picks at five and seven. So I love what he's done so far, not backloading salaries. I love what he did in the draft. I love that he brought back Daniel Jones because I didn't think it was the right year to reach for a quarterback. Um, so so, And I like that he did not extend Daniel Jones as well in the fifth-year option. So, And all short-term contracts and free agency cleared up the cap situation. So, so far, I like what he's done, but he's got a lot more to prove. I'm going to yes. take a slow and steady approach. We'll see what he does. Uh, but so far, so good. Yeah. I agree with you. All right, Chris, before we wrap it up, with training camp a couple weeks away, what are you most excited about and what are you dreading with the upcoming year? With training camp coming up, what am I most excited? I'm the offense. I am most excited about the offense. Um, and I, the offense doesn't need to be the Kansas City Chiefs. The offense doesn't need to be the Green Bay Packers or the Buffalo Bills. I just want to see improvement. I want to see an offense that by the second half of the year, I could say, all right, they're trending towards at least league average. And I think we'll get that. I'm most excited about the growth of the line, Evan Neal, Andrew Thomas on the other side, the new offensive scheme, the playmakers. Um, even if Jones is not going to be the answer, I still think we're going to see a spark in this offense this year than we've seen in, in, in prior years. So that's definitely what I'm most excited about going into the the, the training camp, the preseason, the, the 2022 regular season, for sure. Um, and my biggest worry, like I've said, it's um, the meshing of Don Wink Martindale with the personnel on this defense. It worries yeah. me a bit. I, knowing as aggressive as Wink wants to be with the limitations that I believe we potentially may have in the secondary, it worries me a bit. So that it's it, not that I'm, I'm saying he's going to fail like Betcher did, but I have Betcher vibes in the sense that when Betcher came here, I felt like we were going to be a much more aggressive defense, but we didn't have the personnel in order to do it. Granted, it was a shift. It was a 4-3 defense that we were shifting in one year to a 3-4. So it was a much bigger transition. This was a 3-4 defense that you're kind of keeping similar elements. So it shouldn't be as bumpy as that was. But I worry a bit about that. That's my biggest worry going into the year is, is the is how is Wink going to deal with the, with the personnel we have on this defense? Because if you look at last year when the Ravens didn't have that incredible secondary, that's why he lost his job. The, the defense took a huge step back. So that's my biggest worry going into the year. Yeah. Yeah. I'm with you on that. I mean, I'm excited just because it's a new year, a new regime. I'm thrilled that the fans are going to be back at training camp. You know, I, I, um, you know, I, I, it was touch and go there for a while because you didn't know what was going to happen with, with the virus and whatnot, but fans are coming back. It's going to be a, you know, a great experience. And it's just something with, with the fans there at training camp just kind of makes it, it, it juices you up a little bit more, you know? Um, so I'm excited about that. I'm excited to see what carries over from the spring into the summer. Um, you know, I'm just, I, it's, it's a whole new thing. It's kind of like, you know, you, you've got a, I want to say like a, a, a gift where you've opened this gift up and you're finding out all the little things that are in the box, you know? So that, that has me excited. I've always, I'm always excited when we've got newness coming in. Yeah. Um, concerns. I'm with you on the defense. I, I got to see, you know, cause I, to me, you know, even though I'm not as concerned or as nervous as I was earlier about the defensive secondary, there's still some proving that needs to be done in that unit. Cause you're right. If a Dory Jackson goes down now, they've got to pl plug a guy in there. Yeah, seriously. They've got to <laughs> plug a guy. <laughs> I, th I, I said it on Twitter. I think the most indispensable player on this team is a Dory Jackson. Yeah. I, um, I think you're right because now they've got to go with a guy who maybe isn't as experienced um, although I still say they're going to pick somebody up. 
I think that guy's a veteran, but it's I, a veteran, I, and it's on, and, and that veteran is on somebody else's roster right now. I, 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 I cannot envision this team going forward with the depth that they have now. And I mean, some of these guys could potentially be good, but you don't want to have to, you know, if if you're in the thick of things and you want to compete, you might just have to bite the bullet and bring another guy in. And I, I, I think that's that's what's going to happen here. I think they're going to get I, – I, I agree with you. I think we're going to pick up a veteran late in the process, a guy that, you know, just misses the cut on another roster. I think they will probably do that, but I think they're going to let the young guys play. I, I, yeah. think, I, think, I think the young guys are going to start. They'll bring in a veteran for depth and maybe a guy that can mentor some of the younger players, but I think they're going to see what they got on the other side of the ball. I think the young guys are going to play. They've, done, they've actually done that. You know, I, I think I wrote about that for Giants Country – they actually spent a good part of the spring seeing what they have in the young guys. Now, obviously, no pads, no contacts, so you can only tell so much. But if you remember how Joe Judge ran camp last year, he was more concerned about seeing what he had in the younger guys and not so much about getting the the uh, starters and the, 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 the primary guys up to snuff, you know? So I think Dable kind of took a, the reverse approach. Um, and Chris Peace, Jimmy G's not going to be a giant next year. Just – FYI, he asked. Yeah, about Jimmy I, I very much doubt. I mean, yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't see it now, but but I yeah. doubt. It. But uh, anyway, I, I interrupted my own thought here. I I just like how Dable has approached this whole, you know, the football program so far. Now, there, he's not going to be perfect. We'll see if it plays out. But I'm optimistic. Look, you got, after what we've gone through, I always start off optimistic. You know, is it realistic? You know, I try to be realistic while while being optimistic. Do well, I have what's concerns optimistic for you for this year's team? What's optimistic? Record wise? Yeah. Oh gosh. I would like to see at least eight wins. Okay. I think I, I, I think that's me. possible. Um if they can get to nine, possible. I would I would be happy with, with, with nine, but I, I think eight wins is definitely doable. Yeah. Um, my, my I'm not expecting self says six because in the back of my head, I'm like, what can go wrong will go wrong, but the schedule's so soft that I think we'll, we could win six. My optimistic side is with you. I say eight. It, yeah. it, if, if things break right, and I don't see much more than that, but I, I could see eight. I could see eight. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't think it's going to be playoffs this year. Now, it's possible because the NFC East is still kind of bad. I think by next year, if they're not making – in the conversation for playoffs, then something is radically wrong here. But – this year, I want to see improvement because you're basically starting from scratch with this team, you know, yeah. and, and uh, they want to compete while, while, re while building, not necessarily rebuilding. Rebuilding would be to tear everything down. Well, they, I, I don't think they've, tear, they've torn everything down. They've kept a lot of pieces from the past. So fingers crossed that, you know. And I, I, they, I, the one thing I, I, I think you can look at with this roster and be – encouraged by you look back a couple of years ago we had like no core pieces now we have a year yep you could say we got i mean both our tackles uh mckinney and you know potentially a couple of other players so i i think you could say we have at least four potentially five core pieces on this football team um you know i didn't even mention uh uh, uh what's his uh why why is the name escaping me i've been away from football so the, the other edge rusher that we have uh, from georgia um, oh, Jolari. Oh, Jolari. Yeah. So I think both, I think he's at least trending towards a core piece. You have to hope, obviously, that, uh, you know, both our edge rushers are core pieces, both our tackles are core pieces. And then, you know, obviously our safety with McKinney. So uh, that's one thing that I look at as a Giants fan. I say to myself, all right, that's inspiring. That's something that we could build up of long term. We've got four or five guys that you could build this team around. Of course, it's all going to come down to the quarterback, though. I mean, you look at the best teams in the league right now going into the year. Every one of them, I mean, the Rams, uh, the Bills, uh, the Bengals, they, they have a quarterback. And, you know, you have to hope with the improvements on this roster, it makes Jones better. And if it's not going to be Jones, the guy that comes in. Um, but you need, the, you need the quarterback to be successful in this league to be consistent year in and year out. But I think we've set it up where we have the pieces in place, whether it be the tackles or the scheme, where a quarterback could come in here and be successful. And mm -hmm. we have not had that for a very long time. I'm talking 10 years. Yeah. Uh, so, so that is what's encouraging as a Giants fan long term. Yeah, absolutely. So, all's not totally lost, but you know, look, we can talk and we can we can talk about all the good things and whatnot. 
doesn't mean squat until they get on the field and they actually show it. So yeah. still a lot of unanswered questions, but I'll be there. I know you're going to come out, I, I think, for a couple of practices. Yep, I don't know sure. anybody else is planning to come out. You know, drop a comment in the in, in the box. Let us know if you're going to be out there at practices. Who knows? Maybe we can, you know, the, the, depending on how the schedule falls, we can all catch up in the parking lot or something like that. Yeah, I'd I love think to that do would that. be cool. Um, um, I'm going to know, Fan I, Fest, too. I don't know if you're going to that. I'm going to. I'm what's gonna that? Go fan the fan? fan? Yeah. Oh, the thing. This. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'm covering that one. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, yeah. maybe again, we have to see how the schedule works out because the media, what you guys don't see is the media schedule, all the stuff we have to do, you know, while you guys are coming in or, you know, in between breaks and stuff like that. So they've got to do that. But hopefully, because that's one thing, you know, in the past schedules haven't aligned. And I, I really would like to kind of get out and, you know, say hello to some of you guys and gals, if you, you know, assuming I'm invited. <laughs> I mean, I'm assuming. Um, so yeah, it would be kind of cool. And uh, I'm excited. Well, it'll be here before we know it. Break will be over. And then get ready, my friend, because we'll be going 100 miles a minute. Can't wait. Can't, <laughs> wait, to start talk, can't wait to start talking Giants football. Yeah, amen to that. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us on this live broadcast. And again, apologies for my technical issues i am going to switch laptops i'm gonna to have to I, I i might as well just do it i'll help you do it i'll help you do it my husband's gonna help me do it since he's the one who's gonna say <laughs> i told you so <laughs> so we'll get we'll get that squared away and uh, i'll just have to break in a new laptop it, it is what it is but thank you for joining us here on the locked on giants podcast remember we're still on a summer break meaning we're doing still still doing shows monday wednesday friday one more week we're on the summer break and then we come back five days a week so we'll have the topics. We'll bring back our mailbag, Twitter Tuesday. So you know what to do. Check out the show notes. Thank you so much for tuning in, Chris. Thank you. We'll talk again soon, and I will catch you at training camp, my friend. Can't wait. All right. Take care, everybody. Have a great weekend.